May God fill you all with great hope and joy and peace in your believing. Amen. Our message today for this, the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, is from St. Mark's Holy Gospel, chapter 6, the wonderful account of Jesus and the crowds and how a little feeds so many. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Back in 1983, my home church celebrated Martin Luther's 500th birthday with a play. Well, that's actually 40 years ago. All the youth, the young people, Sunday school all took part, and I was myself 10 years old. For our class confirmation, we sketched drawings of what might be on the cover of that special play, and I drew a picture of Martin Luther, and my pastor chose that drawing for that cover. For a 10-year-old kid, that feels really good to have something you created get used in service to God and for others to see. I even got asked to swing a plastic pitcher of water that kind of was colored to look like beer as a group of us sang a German bar song. It was a good thing we didn't have cell phone cameras then. When something of our own is used in service to God, it's a wonderful encouragement for our faith. Think of that little lunch. Now, Mark's gospel doesn't say it's a little boy. Luke's and John's do. Imagine his thought that what he has is given to Jesus to feed crowds. The only one that Mark records to have food that day. A common poor person lunch was some bread and fish. Little did that boy know just how far that lunch would go. Or that we find this truth so important to our faith all these centuries later. Those people like what they hear and they see in Jesus. Word of his work spreads. The excited crowd obviously had no time to prepare a lunch or to pack anything from home for that day. I'm sure they may not have even thought they'd be gone so long. Jesus had just sent out 72 disciples who created some pretty exciting acts. We read of that last Sunday, turning the world upside down by bringing in Jesus' kingdom. And they returned from their trips, and it's been constant movement since. Jesus' presence must have almost had a celebrity vibe, or maybe created some sentimental ideal, but they crave his attention. There's no rest, there's no escape, and rest time we know is very important. We ourselves can stretch our human ability just so far before we collapse. Jesus finds rest for his disciples in a desolate place, a wilderness place. It's a territory that is usually reserved for religious announcements, turning away from a sinful course of life. It's often the home of lepers and all those deemed unfit for society. It usually isn't a place of rest. But rest isn't always a vacation. In stressful times, just stopping to take a breath can help you. When you breathe in, breathe out, sometimes that can even diminish the problem. I learned that over the years reading scripture and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who had his own method of breathing in, breathing out, praying that God would empty him of the certain troubles or sins he had and then fill him with the love, the peace. And that can be a very calming, prayerful exercise itself. Jesus sees these people with compassionate eyes. He deeply feels their desperate need like sheep without a shepherd. They go it alone in life. Israel's religion had failed them. Unmovable boundaries around people. They were concerned about nitpicky details that were quite petty. Acts of love weren't meant for everyone in need. Temple life promoted a separation from God instead of an inclusion. Jesus overcomes these walls with mercy, with compassion, with welcome. He removes the barriers that keep people removed from God. He absorbs the world's suffering and is suffering every time he stops to help them. The disciples will see this as a bit of an aggravation. Our Lord sees the emptiness, the longing, the fear, the despair that creates a frenzy. He always sees right into the human heart. Hearts so messed up by personal traumas that it's all twisted in on itself. He looks at our lives still that way too. 
our concerns that absorb us so much we only think about it, the chasing and running around that we've all done, establishing our own ways to make sure things stay the way they are for ourselves. We crave predictability, and Jesus knows that. He knows our ways better than we do, but our lives cannot always be predictable, but our Lord is. He's changeless in that way. But I'm sure the disciples there have no idea what to expect. They see no connection between their recent mission success and this very moment in that desolate place. Sun's going down. Hour is hastening on. The listening is done. Time to go. Let the crowds feed themselves. That's a lot to take on. That's a huge crowd. It says over 5,000 men, and in biblical days, women and children would have been there but wouldn't have been counted. So we've got over 5,000 for sure. And this moment reveals the point of Jesus' real entire ministry. If the disciple just came back from powerful mission experience, surely they trust Jesus will make this a problem, a powerful event. He's got this. Just grab a little food and you'll see. They're afraid, though. The disciples' fear breeds that need for control and dismissiveness. It's a fight-or-flight response. Contain the problem. Keep this all at arm's length. It'll figure itself out. Fear thrives when trust runs low. But Jesus redirects the fear with noticing need. Here, you guys feed them. You find them something to eat. To now on, look at ministry as how can I be of service to someone else? Fear turns into helping people and a godly gratitude begins to grow. Gratitude towards Jesus and a gratitude for all that he gives. Our Lord is also showing two opposite ways of being in the world. His kingdom versus the earthly kingdom they know. Herod rules Jewish life. Caesar rules everything else. And we heard that also last Sunday where Herod led pride dictate personal favors. And Jesus' cousin John the baptizer's head is cut off. Our Lord rolls out a new wilderness kingdom, marked by teaching and feeding, making it both practical and spiritual. Grouping them on the green grass, Jesus sits them all down. Green grass in the ancient world usually means growth. Springtime is here. So we know the time of the year even. Grouping them on the green grass as he does, that green color is rarely mentioned in the Bible. Color isn't always part of the scripture other than skies and even there, blue sky we don't often hear. But green means there's growth, there's new life. A blessing is about to happen to these ancient people. And Mark is specific. He writes how Jesus sits them in rows and groups them. And interestingly, in the biblical Greek, that row seating we have there is a gardening term. Like when they planted rows of grapes in a vineyard or flower bed which also has a little bit to do with the history behind why we even have people grouped in pews in a church. There's growth. We are the new Israel, the new vineyard of our Lord, because Jesus isn't there planting a kingdom that's taking root with trees and plants. He's planting people. These will be the human pillars for the new temple, Jesus' own very house, the future church with himself as the cornerstone foundation. And by the time it's all done, his feast feeds like never before. And that feast isn't served to Herod or to high-ranking officials or to the Roman government or any in a king's palace. It's a divine oasis of hope, putting down roots in the hardest of ground. And the highest-ranking officials, which would be the disciples, are the ones serving the meal. From a shepherd king who comes not to be served, but to serve, who shares all that he has with the many, who lets his... Life and reputation take the hits for his compassion. Living as Jesus' followers is very involved, as we all know. And when we follow a compassionate Lord, his care and the need to be concerned with care will rub off. We can't deny our own hunger that we feel. Or when we see another person's hunger. Nothing else can take the place of Jesus because he fills the biggest hunger and he always meets our need. He lightens our heavy load with his burdenless path. Our eyes, we see limitations. He sees potential. We see the absence of resources. He sees the abundance of opportunity. We see the cost. He sees the outcome. We see people with real deep needs, and we worry about if we can fix it or if we have time or how much to commit. 
But Jesus sees a world that is to die for. In fact, he did die for. And he invites us, his disciples today, to view the world the same way. Not a pesky crowd, but sheep with no shepherd. Lost, scattered, hurting, messed up with who finds solace in the good shepherd. It is a repentant renewal that simply sees things as Jesus sees them. No one goes broke from being generous. With a little bread and fish in his hands, looking up to heaven, praying, Jesus feeds the multitudes. He who is our very bread of life gives us bread today, our daily bread. We pray for and enjoy with the abundance we have in our own homes and maybe some leftovers in our fridge too. Twelve baskets that day, which is a wonderful holy number. The twelve apostles, the twelve tribes of Israel, that is holy and heavenly. Enough for everybody and more. It is never going to run out because Jesus has attached his word to the things we need. Nothing is too lowly to use. That poor boy's lunch becomes a banquet no one has ever yet seen. He attaches that word to the bread and wine we have in our church. And it brings his body and blood to our communion. Or when we pray at our meals, the blessing of our Lord is attached to our dinner or breakfast prayers and what a feast we have. And at that meal, we look back at the communion rail and we see the suffering of Jesus on the cross where he forgives and he defeats all that stands against us. Our sin, the evil, the hurt, gone. And that meal helps us look forward to the day when we will eat at the banquet that we've always wanted. When our deepest hungers are fully satisfied, that is how we live in the present, for we are Jesus' fortified, structured body in the world. We're his hands, his mouth, his feet. He takes us and provides healing grace to the desolation of life everyone around us feels. And that will always satisfy the overflowing forgiveness, the life, the new hope, the peace, the joy. And there's always more with Jesus. <clears throat> Truly, the church is simply a divine dispenser of living bread. We take what Jesus gives and we pass it around. We don't concern ourselves with how it all arrived, but just so that we all depart having encountered the living God. That's really what evangelism is. Whatever we have, or whatever our talent or interest is, Jesus uses it in service to his people as we encounter them. We give as we have received. Just We just never know how the little we do does really help. How amazing it is when we have or what we make is used by God to uplift people. Jesus takes our little and makes it a lot. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now with the peace of God which goes beyond our human understanding, guard your hearts and lives in the one true faith in Jesus Christ, now and always. Amen.